Hey guys, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at wireless mobility concepts within Cisco wireless LAN controllers. In wireless environments with multiple access points, mobility roaming takes place all of the time. As such, it's important to understand the different types of roaming that can occur. If you'd like to read along with the lesson, you can find a link to our website in the description below. To start with, let's recap on what a wireless roam is. A wireless roam occurs when a client moves from one access point to another, as shown in the example here. In addition to this, wireless networks can be deployed in a number of different topologies. Depending on our wireless design, there are a number of different roaming events that can occur. These include intracontroller roaming, intercontroller roaming layer 2, intercontroller roaming layer 3, and auto anchor mobility. As we proceed through the lesson, let's break each one of these roaming events down to understand how they occur and what takes place in the background. We'll start with the intracontroller roaming. This roaming event occurs when a client roams between access points associated to the same controller. In our example on the screen, we've got two access points, AP01 and AP02. These access points are associated to a single wireless controller, WLC01. Within our controller, it maintains a client database. This contains information on how to reach all clients within the wireless environment. When client A roams from AP01 to AP02, the wireless controller will update the client database on how to reach client A, which you can see on the updated topology. The intracontroller roaming method is one of the most simplest methods of roaming. Next up, let's take a look at intercontroller roaming, layer 2. This roaming event occurs when a client roams between access points associated to two different controllers. In order for the roam to be classed as layer 2 intercontroller roaming, both controllers will have an interface in the client subnet. In our example, we've got two APs associated to two different controllers. We have AP01 associated to WLC01, and AP02 is associated to WLC02. In addition to this, both controllers are located within the same network, 10.10.10.0/24. Client A in our example is associated to AP01 with an IP address of 10.10.10.1. As before, both of our controllers each maintain a client database. This is used by the controllers to know how to reach the clients. When client A roams from AP01 to AP02, an intercontroller roam has taken place. Importantly, as both controllers and APs are operating on the same layer 2 subnet, this is classed as an intercontroller layer 2 roam. When this roam occurs, the following actions take place. Number 1, mobility messages are exchanged between the controllers. And number 2, the client database entry for client A is moved from WLC01 to WLC02. Importantly, as both controllers are located within the same subnet, client A will keep the original IP address 10.10.10.1 without having to request a new IP address. Next up, we'll look at intercontroller roaming layer 3. As we've just discussed previously, an intercontroller roam occurs when a client roams between access points associated to different controllers. The big difference for the roam to be classed as layer 3, however, is that both controllers will be on separate subnets. In our topology on the screen, we've got two access points associated to two different controllers. AP01 is associated to WLC01, and AP02 is associated to WLC02. Both controllers are located on different subnets. WLC01 is located on 10.10.10.0/24, and WLC02 is located within 10.10.20.0/24. So what happens when client A roams to AP02? The AP it has whilst associated to AP01 isn't going to work. The client would need to request another IP address from a DHCP server and obtain a new IP address. Can you imagine the disruption this would cause to our client, especially if the client is using real-time applications? Thankfully, Cisco has a trick for the client to roam seamlessly. This time, when client A roams from AP01 to AP02, a number of actions take place. Number 1. Mobility messages are exchanged between WLC01 and WLC02. Secondly, the client database entry for client A is copied from WLC01 to WLC02. Thirdly, controllers are allocated either the anchor or foreign controller role. Finally, number 4. Controllers are allocated either the POA, point of association, or POP, point of presence role. So client A is now associated to AP02, connected to WLC02. WLC01 in this example is then classed as the anchor controller for client A. The controller that client A roams to will be classed as the foreign controller. In this example, it's WLC02. 
Want to know the great thing about this room? Client A will keep the IP address it had whilst associated to AP01. But you might be thinking, how is this possible? In order for this to happen, a CatWAP tunnel is created between WLC01 and WLC02. This CatWAP tunnel will then be used to tunnel all traffic for Client A back to WLC01. What this then does is allows Client A to retain its IP address and operate on a foreign controller. Traffic to and from Client A is then routed back to the anchor controller via the CatWAP tunnel between WLC01 and WLC02. You'll notice two additional bits of information on our topology that we've not discussed yet. These are POA, point of association, and POP, point of presence. During layer three roams, these two roles are introduced. The point of association role is used to identify both the controller and AP where the client is currently associated. In our example, client A is still associated to WLC02, so this is the POA. It's worth noting that the POA role moves with the client as it roams. If we have another controller named WLC03 and our client roamed to this, WLC03 would take the POA role. The other role, point of presence, is used to refer to the controller where the client can be accessed. A common mistake is to think this role is assigned to the controller the client first associates to. This, however, is incorrect, as you'll see in the final section. In our example on the screen, WLC01 is the POP for client A, as client A can be accessed via 10.10.10.1 through WLC01. Finally, the last roaming event that occurs is known as Auto Anchor. This roaming event focuses heavily on the anchor and foreign roles we've just discussed. What Auto Anchor allows us to do is anchor a WLAN to a specific controller within our environment. The most common use case for this is guest access. Allowing guests onto our corporate network is a big no-no. Instead, what we can do is force all clients connected to the network to be forced onto a specific wireless controller located within a DMZ network. In our example, we have AP01 associated to WLC01. In addition to this, we've also got a separate wireless controller, WLC02. This is sat behind a firewall within a DMZ. Client A then connects to our guest SSID advertised on AP01. With auto anchor mode, all the guest traffic from client A will be tunneled to WLC02 via an EO IP tunnel. From here, the guest traffic is then piped directly out to the internet. You can see in the updated figure to better understand this. Traffic from client A is tunneled to our wireless controller in the DMZ. This way, none of the traffic can touch our corporate network and can be sent straight out to the internet. And there we have it. That's an overview of the different mobility concepts within Cisco wireless networks. If you've liked the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Again, you can also follow along with this lesson over on our website, link in the description below.